made it? Well, you've made it. This is the destination that the Lord had played out for you well ahead of time. Well before you were even born, we're, we're here or at the Deer Lakes Community Church of the Nazarene. This week we are in week two of our Waymaker series. Um, I'm asking you to, if there's a Bible near you, which there should be, um, turn to the book of Luke chapter 22. I would probably call that about, let's call it 61% of the way into the Bible maybe. Okay? But Luke chapter 22, verses 47 to 57. Here's the word of the Lord. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who called Judas, who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Judas, uh, Jesus and kissed him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike out with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kind of kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, he had sat down together. Peter sat down with him. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight and looked at him closely and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. This is the word of the Lord. Last day on earth. You ever thought about that? Your, your, your last day on earth. Maybe I've, I've heard those types of sayings or like the last 24 hours that you got to have um, around. What are some of those things that you might want to do? Last 24 hours. Let me hear a shout out. What's something that you want to do? Hug my kids. Hug your kids. All right. Let me hear some more. This is an interactive part of the service. Last 24 hours on earth, what are you about to do? Pray. All right. Anybody want to eat? Yes. <laughs> I'm not trying to be silly. I'm just, you know, there's things that I want to do. I think of like those statements of like, you know, like death penalty stuff, like that last meal on earth. And you're thinking about like, hey, what do I want to eat? My, I'm probably eating sushi on a lot of it, like a lot. Jesus' last night on earth. What he didn't do was spend it, you know, maybe driving. I would also, when I'm thinking about it, you know, what, what Jesus is going to do, but what I would want to do, I want to go really fast. Like, really fast somehow. Like, if, if I got blessed somehow, knowing it's the last day on earth, to be like, listen, you get to drive one of these NASCARs, and you're going all the way. Like, just open that puppy up and go. But... Jesus, last night on earth, was spent eating a meal. Spent eating a meal with his 12 disciples. He earnestly desired to eat this meal with them. Because he knew what was about to happen. He knew that he was about to die and suffer that next day. Okay, so in this Waymaker series, we're going to jump around a little bit. We're looking at miracles and we're looking at how Jesus and God as a whole, made a way. And so we're at this part in the scripture where this Last Supper, where we, we didn't hear about it when we're reading, but we're hearing about it and, and where the context of where this passage came from. That Last Supper, when you're thinking maybe of that last meal on earth, 
um, Jesus' last meal on earth could have possibly been to him a little bit disappointing. I don't know if you've ever eaten a Seder meal. There was some pickled stuff in it and, and, and beets and things like that. It's, it's, I wouldn't call it the most filling meal of all time, but this is around that final thing. Instead of um, having just a casual dinner, though, it's a significant time that Jesus gets to have with his, uh, with his disciples. But as the evening progresses, <coughs> things quickly begin to degenerate into Judas's deception, uh, deception. The disciples started descending, meaning like they, they were very scared. And we heard and we saw they'll start to run. And we heard a little bit about Peter beginning to deny. And then we think, too, about what is going on with the disciples because, like I said, they start descending into different, like, not madness per se, but going, oh, no, what do I do now? And so eventually like, all this kind of stuff is happening, right? Jesus asks them after a, a meal, Probably, maybe around midnight-ish. It's late. Jesus asks his then 11 disciples, Will you come and pray with me? <clears throat> I, I'm sure he was a good host in the meal. We saw that. We read that. We're going to participate in, in that meal in a little bit as well. But I'm sure Jesus presented himself a little bit weary as well. And so the rest of them, they all went to the Mount of Olives where they planned to stay the night. When they arrived, Jesus went further and spent time in prayer before Judas came and betrayed him to the religious authorities. I would say that all of us like a certain level of control in our lives. Does that make sense? Like... To have a certain level of control, we often we make long-term plans, short-term plans, mid-term type of plans, and some of those plans end up involving interest rates that are like way higher than we thought, or when we have like our best laid out plans, like the best ideas that we think we have, our plans end up shifting. You ever realize that? Um, maybe in those best case scenario plans where you think everything's going to go really super well, an illness then just appears. I, I found it almost reliable that we're going to go away on vacation. We're going to go do something fun. One of my kids gets a cold every single time. Or a tummy bug in the middle of that trip. Where like, illnesses that just kind of occur. Sometimes you were expecting, hoping um, for bright, clear, sunny skies, and then it gets really cloudy and starts to rain. I think that happened on the 4th this year. We were expecting some nice, clear skies, and it rained from 9 o'clock to later. Which I'm assuming that just meant everybody waited till last night when I was like at the most tired that I've been this week to like just release some of the most epic fireworks all around, right around here, that I've experienced. One thing we learn in life, though, is that we are not ultimately fully in control of our lives. But everything that we will read in these next coming weeks, everything that you will read, if you decide to pick up this book and look at it, and start feasting on the words, everything about Jesus' ministry, we have to notice that Jesus was always in control of every event in his life. Between him and God, always in control. Nothing happened that was beyond his control and God's control. And yet, when we read about it, <clears throat> our human side, it seemed to change a little bit all that night. With his betrayal and his arrest in, in that garden. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to seek and save the lost. 
We know this, again, if you pick up this book, that the beginning of his ministry went pretty well. There was a lot of frustration from religious leaders, but things got off well. There was throngs of, there's huge amounts of crowds that loved to listen to Jesus, loved to like follow him around and pack him up. You, you heard about it a little bit last week when we talked about how, how much this crowd kind of just went on him and he was preaching inside of a house and then they ripped open a ceiling just so more people could hear and be touched and seen by him. Thousands have benefited from his miracles in that day. People were so taken with Jesus that they wanted to, and you, you, if you think back to Palm Sunday, they wanted to crown him as their king. But Jesus refused to be sidetracked. Instead, he kept proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, calling people to repent of their sins and believe that he was the only savior of the sinners between him and God. But over time, opposition arose against Jesus and his ministry. After Jesus entered Jerusalem again on Palm Sunday, the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men were seeking to destroy him. Like seeking to find a way to break all that was good. Things then seemed to get out of control. Mass was happening. Good dinner happened. Jesus slips away with his friends and he says, just come pray with me. I know you're tired. And he starts praying and, and Judas will then eventually come with a crowd to betray Jesus and have him arrested. But Jesus, again, had been praying in that garden. He was praying such a, I won't even call it an aggressive prayer, but a passionate prayer. He was in such a form of grief, knowing full well what was about to happen. It was such agony that his sweat became like great droplets of blood that fell upon the ground. That is the type of anguish that he was going through, knowing what was going to occur. Although he asked his heavenly father if there was some other way to accomplish the salvation of sinners, he was resolute in his obedience by saying, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he finished his prayer. Can you imagine that prayer? Like, again, we, we don't have to draw this out completely, but this is like knowing that he's about to go through literal hell on earth. Like taking everything that wasn't for him upon him for us. Then he finished praying. And he went back and he saw, remember, he, he had mentioned a couple times that his Disciples had been sleeping and he woke them up a couple times. Can't you just, we've spent all these years together. Can't you just stay awake a little bit longer? Like, can't you just be with me a little bit more? And he walks over to his disciples seeing them sleepy. Though things were about to change, Jesus was still in control. With the power of God flowing through him. But then this happens. There's a massive scuffle. If you can imagine, there's clanging and banging and listening and like swords coming and all the armor of the soldiers and whatnot, and the feet trampling. I am assuming that everybody, I don't know about how you wake up. I'm going to tease Ava because she is not here. Ava wakes up in a way that, and maybe some of you wake up too. I could, I could wake her up in the most gentle of life, Ava. It's time for school. And this child shoots straight up and looks directly at you. I don't know if you do one of those things as well. But it's a surprising way to wake up. And then there's a little, you know, like the eyes open up really bright and really big. And it's kind of startling to me. But I'm assuming that although his disciples, his friends are tired, when they hear all the mess and all the noise, they wake up fully alarmed. Because they've been fearful. They've been fearful and worried that something was going to happen to Jesus. He had mentioned at that dinner, like, it's time. My body will be broken. My blood will be spilled. 
And they're tired, you know. And they sit up, I'm assuming, in, a, in one of those fight or flight types of moves. Because remember, some of the disciples, they take off. So there's the flight. And others wake up ready to go. Even though they've been with this peaceful Jesus who has never taught violence, they wake up ready to go. So in this passage, the most shocking part of Christ's miracle is not what is done, but it is who it's done to. And so when they wake up, some wake up ready to fight. And we heard it in the words like, Lord, what should we do? Should we draw our swords? I don't exactly know why Jesus' disciples were carrying around swords, for they were not soldiers, but they had carried swords and they were ready to go. Peter then gets a little aggressive. And in the mid loud scuffle, and I'm not sure that he was aiming for anybody particular. Maybe you've experienced one of those types of ruckuses in your lifetime. You don't even know what you're swinging at, but here it is. And Peter swings the, swings the sword and off comes an ear. He's looking to kill. I don't know, what, again, this is Peter, not the trained soldier. This is Peter, the fisherman, who's just reacting out of anger and fear and stress. And he cuts off an ear. He didn't look for Judas like, all right, punk. Like, you want to portray my savior with a kiss? You're going to learn today. This is, this is just out of fight or flight. He decides fight, slices off an ear. Christ then comes and goes, wow, this is not what we do. Christ heals the man who came to take him and torture him to his death. A person who we would consider, and Peter considered an enemy. Again, and yet, Peter treats this person with violence. Christ then treats this person with love and compassion. In fact, to the point of rebuking the one that says he loves them the most. Just as Christ heals this man's ear, Christ heals our violent and destructive hearts. Allowing us to follow him with grace and forgiveness. It's this thing that's been wrestling it with in my mind about, you know, when we call out for justice of things like that. Often when we're crying out for justice, what we're really calling out for is vengeance. We want to see something worse happen for the effect that has been done to us. Despite Christ's insistence throughout the gospel to love our enemies and to turn the other cheek, his disciples ask Christ whether they should attack the armed mob who comes to arrest Jesus and proceeds to strike out in violence. They just aren't listening. This violent act of Peter, again, is perhaps born out of religious zeal as he wants to protect his Savior, or it's just... He woke up pretty startled, and he wants to do whatever he can. <clears throat> Only moments before all this mess, Jesus keeps reaching out to his disciples, as he said, why are you sleeping? Like, just be awake and be ready for what's going to come. Rise and pray that you might not enter into temptation. The temptation that they ended up entering into is one of violence and destruction. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man named Judas, the one of the twelve, was leading him. He drew near to Jesus, and he kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? We can understand what a massive betrayal this was when we remember what Jesus had done for Judas. First, Judas was one of the twelve that is chosen. Judas was chosen by Jesus to be one of his twelve disciples. Here's a quick reminder. Jesus doesn't make mistakes. God never makes mistakes in who he chooses. He had been specifically chosen and called by Jesus 
to be with him for at least three years. He traveled along with them. Remember this again, too. So because Judas had traveled with Jesus during this time, Judas heard all the teachings. What would any one of us give to hear Jesus in person for three minutes, let alone three years? He had a front row seat to every lesson that Jesus got to preach and teach. He heard Jesus proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God and how one is able to enter the kingdom of God by only faith and repentance. Jesus saw, Judas saw Jesus' miracles for all that time. He saw thousands of people healed, lives transformed. He saw people have demons cast out of them. He saw Jesus raising dead people back to life. Jesus personally benefited from Jesus' miracles when he ate the bread and the fish that Jesus created when he fed thousands of people. And he also had his fears relieved when Jesus calmed a storm in the Sea of Galilee. He was there the entire time. Judas was given opportunities to serve in ministry. He served as the treasurer for all of the apostles. He held all of the monies. He also went out with the other disciples, with the other apostles through villages, and he preached the gospel, and he himself helped practice the healing of other people. Jesus was showing Judas again and again that he was the Christ, the one sent by God to seek and save the lost. Even at the last moments of Jesus' you know, earthly, we'll call it ministry, right at that meal, even at the meal, knowing full well what was about to come, Jesus still serves this meal to a friend. So Satan incites Judas to betray Jesus to the religious authorities. But even though Judas betrayed Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus still reached out to Judas. Like all that stuff, even the meal, and then leading to this, Jesus still connects with them. In the very act of betrayal, Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Here's the reality. Jesus will always and has always, period. There's no questions about this. You can try to ask me, and you can try to argue with me about this. It's okay to be wrong. Jesus still loves lost sinners every single time. Every single time. Even in the moment of betrayal, even in the moment of looking God and, or Jesus right in the face and being like, I hate you. He still loves people that much to still reach out and to still offer this bridge of connection. Alexander McLaren puts it this way. Thus to the end of Christ seeks to keep him from ruin and with meek patience represents not indignity but with a majestic calmness set before the miserable man the hideousness of his acts. Here's my question. Have you ever felt betrayed? I certainly have. Have you ever felt or heard a close friend turn on you? I certainly have. Jesus knows our pain and our sufferings. No one has ever and will ever experience a greater betrayal than Jesus just knows how you feel, though. Part of Jesus' suffering was that of betrayal. So Jesus is able to sympathize with you in your suffering because he personally experienced the betrayal of Jesus. When you feel betrayed or when you are betrayed, my encouragement is to talk to the king about it. He understands exactly what pain you are suffering from. 
Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. But even with that kiss, Jesus was still in control. You may remember that earlier in the furnished upper room, the disciples assured Jesus that they at least had two swords. Like Jesus, we're packing. We, we got this, okay? If anything goes down, we got you. Peter even went to, as far as to say that he was ready to go to prison or even just, Lord, I will die with you. So as the crowd closes in on Jesus to arrest him, and when the disciples who were around him saw what they saw, and they startled awake as some ran, others said, Lord, are we about to do this? Is it about to go down? Because the common response would be, fight back. Run or fight back. When we feel betrayed, we immediately start thinking of how we can get back at our betrayer. Right or wrong? It's, it's one of those processes that come in when we feel really hurt. We can pull back and run, or we can, I want justice. When I want justice, I often want vengeance. That's what we used to tell our students when we would send students to team camp or camps in general. We, we, would, we would take a nix on pranks. Um, pranks are funny. You know, somebody does something silly to one person, but a prank never levels out to the same level of what the prank had already done. If you're going to prank, you then take another step. I took your sock and I hung it up here. I took your underwear and hung it on the flagpole. You're welcome. <laughs> Inside out. Okay. And it always goes in different levels because we're not, we're not really seeking an eye for an eye. We're seeking like a head for that eye. We want to get some sort of revenge against the person who betrayed or hurt us. Philip Reichen notes, that some of the greatest stories in, the, in literature are based off of betrayal and revenge. Consider the Count of Monte Cristo, the famous novel written by Alexander Dumas, in which the young Edmund uh, Dantes is betrayed by three jealous friends and sent to prison. After making his escape and finding his fortune, um, Dante systematically takes revenge on each of his hated enemies driving them into financial ruin, public disgrace, suicide, or insanity. And I'm sure we clapped as we read it. There is something about a juicy story like that. Payback, baby. Something that appeals to our fallen nature. It satisfies our craving for revenge. The disciples of Jesus reacted immediately when they saw that he was betrayed. One of them, as we know, as we've said now, Peter, struck the servant. Again, I'm assuming, out of sheer chaos, strikes the servant of the high priest and cuts off his right ear. Peter uses a sword. But again, he is pouring. There is a time and a place for the proper use of the sword. There's this movie uh, I, I, I watched kind of recently, but it's from 2013. It's called The Railway Man. It recounts a true story of hate, trauma, and ultimately forgiveness. It follows this uh, British officer named Eric Lomax. He's an officer from World War II who was captured and sent to a Japanese prisoner of war camp where he was tortured. 30 years later, after he was re rescued, Lomax learns that one of his captors and tormentors has then escaped war crimes and is actually working as a tour, this is wild to me, was working as a tour guide in the very camp that he worked at And Lomax was a prisoner in. 
So now he's a tour guide showing what he's done as a, as a, maybe a moment of atonement, if you will. Lomax was still suffering from psychological trauma from his time in the camp and goes to confront the man. At first, he uses violence against the man who tortured them 30 years ago. But he takes some time, somehow, somehow, the Lord speaks to him in a way, and he starts to reflect, and he actually makes peace with his enemy. And then somehow, from World War II, they remain friends until their death in 2011, in 2012. So they somehow reconciled and found that. You can look it up. The Railway Man. Railway Man. If you're ever interested in watching it. In Luke. 22. That we read from. Christ rebukes the disciples for sleeping rather than praying. For showing themselves to be undisciplined and unaware of the Lord's plan. Even as he spoke it to them. wake up and they're startled. They're startled because they weren't ready. They react how a startled person would react. They were wrong. No matter how bad it got, they were still wrong. And to think about this, to furthermore, Jesus actually didn't need their protection. You know, they talk like, Jesus, we've got these two swords, we're ready to go. Whether they're sharpened or not, like, we're ready to go. Jesus did not need their protection. <laughs> Jesus could have had 12 legions of angels that could have protected him. A legion is a lot. Okay, so it's not just 12 angels, it's a lot of angels. And they're scary. When one shows up, every single time an angel shows up, they always say, don't be afraid. 12 legions of angels... It's pretty terrifying. But the main reason that Peter uses the sword was that he just didn't get this redemptive plan. A short while later, after this like swinging of a sword and Jesus placing an ear back on the head, Jesus, I mean, Judah, Peter had just run off. Just like the rest of them, just run off. And he's, but he's always at least trying to be in almost eyesight with Jesus. Peter starts denying, remember Jesus said, he told him, like, you're going to do this. You're not going to do it one time, you're not going to do it two times, you're going to do it three times. The disciple who went as so far as to say that he was ready to go to jail, go to the cross, or just blatantly die with Jesus. The lesson before us is deeply instructive. To suffer patiently for Christ is far more difficult than to work actively. To sit still and calmly endure is far more hard than to stir about and take part in the battle. And at times the battle is just anxiety. It's the chaos that goes on all around us. Crusaders will always be found more numerous than martyrs. The passive graces of religion are far more rare and precious than the active graces. Working for Christ may be done for many spurious motives, from excitement, from emulation, from party spirit, or from the love of praise. Suffering for Christ will seldomly be endured from anyone but within one motive, and that motive is the grace of God. There is unique stories that we can look into. There's great movies that I'm sure you can find. Again, stories of justice and revenge, and revenge, but there's also these stories that we can find of peace. There are times that you might feel that you or someone you care about has been wronged. But we 
very careful about your reaction. Jesus immediately repaired the damage done by Peter and said, no more of this. And he touched the servant of the high priest's ear and healed him. This was Jesus' last miracle. And this was a very important one. It protected him from any accusations that he was trying to set up a military kingdom. It showed that Jesus was completely opposed to unwarranted violence. But most importantly, as uh, this author Philip Ryken said, it says, it also ended any attempt to hinder his progress towards the cross where he died for our sins. That was it. When Jesus performed this miracle, he was showing his purpose to bring salvation and his willingness to suffer injustices for the glory of God. For he will heal. And he will make all things right. Did that man who got his ear cut off decide to change from his evil ways and follow this Christ who put an ear back on his head? I don't know. But it did some weird type of kickstart to the disciples who have already seen it. After Jesus heals the ear, he addresses those who have come to arrest him. Not only did this mob come to arrest him in a secluded place, but they were prepared for an armed conflict. He says to them, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? So while the mob met with violence initially, Christ continues to surprise. He prevented, this is big, further bloodshed. As he showed compassion to the injured man, in a sense, Christ continues to reveal the depths of his love to those around him, and he doesn't, always, he doesn't only heal those who deserve healing. He doesn't only heal those who are qualified. He even chose to heal those who persecuted him. Christ modeled forgiveness. Period. Even to those who have hurt us. Turning our enemies into friends. This passage has two important ramifications for Christians. First, Christ heals the violence and anger in our hearts. Some of us have a lot of that. Anger bubbles within us of change and frustration and chaos. It's what we've tried to learn and, and walk with over this last year when we use that phrase that everything is movable. Even our hearts are movable. While humanity was still his enemy, Christ showed compassion and love. Second, this passage changes the way that Christians deal with enemies, with those whom they dislike or even hate. Christ calls them to love those people, even if it's at a great cost. The cost of Jesus, after all, was his death and torture. Think about the person in your life for whom you've been harboring hatred and anger, distaste, and find some way, and it is dramatically hard. Find some way to show compassion and love to the individual. You might really be surprised at how healing that compassion and love can be. Amen. So what we're going to do as we close, we're going to serve communion. I'm going to invite Pastor Les and Larry to come up, and they're going to offer you all communion. And we're going to do so in remembrance of he who deserved it. He did not deserve any of the suffering that he did. But we're going to remember the one who deserves all the praise. We're going to take communion in the same way, in the same spirit, 
and remembering that even Judas, even one in the pit and midst of chaos, got to take this meal. So how we're going to do it is they're going to stand forward. I'm going to invite you to come forward.